Welcome AP Biology students. This is your lecture uh, on Unit 5, which is the study of heredity. And in Topic 1, we're going to look at meiosis. And then in Topic 2, we're going to look at uh, meiosis and genetic diversity. So essentially, uh, let's take a look first at what heredi heredity is. If we think of heredity, it's a an area of biology known as genetics. And genetics is the study of heredity and hereditary variation. Ultimately, heredity itself is the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. And uh, <clears throat> traits themselves are going to be passed on from parent to offspring through genes. But one might say, well, what are genes? Genes are segments of DNA that code for the basic units of heredity. So they're going to code for the characteristics. So these are the regions on the DNA molecule that are able to be read and have some sort of phenotypic expression. Offspring acquire genes from parents by inheriting chromosomes, and we're going to look at uh, how that is done. U ultimately, um, if you look at this picture, you could see a group of siblings there, and um, they have some characteristics or traits that are common to each other, uh, like hair color. But they, they are uh, uniquely different from each other as well. And that's because of, of meiosis and how meiosis leads to gen genetic variability among the offspring um, during sexual reproduction and the formation of those gametes. So let's look at the two reproductive, reproductive uh, methods. There is asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Um, asexual reproduction involves a single individual. There is no fusion of gametes. Uh, gametes are going to be the sperm and the egg. Uh, often when you uh, reproduce asexually, the offspring are going to be clones. And, and clones are when the offspring are going to be exact copies of the parent. And ultimately, because it's a female that is uh, giving birth to these clones, uh, the offspring themselves will be of the female gender as well. The only source of mutations are going to be uh, uh, mutations within the DNA that are going to lead to a, a source of variation. Uh, other than that, uh, they, do, they do truly stay as genetic clones of the parent unless those mutations do take place. And ultimately, when reproducing asexually, um, a lot of times organisms can reproduce asexually through a process called mitosis, which we learned about last chapter. But uh, we see this with, with bacteria, some protists. Um, they can reproduce through mitosis via a process called binary fission. Sex reproduction, on the other hand, involves two parents, typically male and female. Um, offspring are unique combinations of genes from parents. Um, the offspring have both the paternal chromosomes and the maternal chromosomes that give that kind of blended inheritance there. Well, not really blend it, but a, a, a uh, um, you get kind of like these mix of traits from both parents. Uh, the offspring themselves are going to be genetically varied from parents and siblings. And ultimately, that's because of, of this process called meiosis. But before we could study meiosis, let's take a look at, at homologous chromosomes. And we're going to look at the chromosomes that we get from our father, which are paternal chromosomes, and the mother's chromosomes, which are maternal chromosomes. So homologous chromosomes, also known as homologs, are a pair of chromosomes that are of the same size, length, and shape. And when we talk about shape, we're looking at that centromere position. The centromere, of course, being where two sister chromatids are going to attach each other, attach to each other when there is a replicated chromosome. And you can't really see it in the picture, but um, <clears throat> those homologous chromosomes, uh, you have two, two sister chromatids there for the paternal and two sister chromatids there for the maternal chromosome. Additionally to the size, shape, and length, um, these chromosomes also have the same genes because they are the same chromosome number there. So one homologous chromosome is inherited from mom and one is inherited from dad, leading to the maternal and paternal chromosomes. Uh, 
And we could see these chromosomes all laid out in pairs 1 through 23 as associated with a human when we look at karyotypes. So karyotypes line up these chromosomes based on um, their height and they'll line them up along their centromere positions. And you can see that these homologs basically are the same size, same shape, uh, which is where their centromeres are located and of the same length. And then you have those different bands of blackness on there. That's going to re represent banding patterns. So karyotypes themselves uh, are, is a display of chromosome pairs ordered by size and length. Um, a pair of homologous duplicated chromosomes can be seen right there with the black and yellow chromosomes. That would be pair one of 23 pairs. Note in an actual karyotype, it is difficult to see the sister chromatids within each pair. Um, typically, it's so small that you just see one little pan pattern, but you can see those banding patterns for the, where the genes are. <clears throat> So when we look at cells and chromosomes, basically there are two types of cells. There are somatic cells, which are body cells, and somatic cells are going to be diploid in chromosome number. And diploid is often abbreviated 2N, and, and somatic cells being diploid means that these cells have two complete sets of each chromosome. Um, for humans, oh, that would be 46, so you'd have 46 chromosomes within the, the nucleus. Um, so if you're looking there, um, somatic cells would be like your basic cell types of the body, like the nerve cells, heart cells, muscle cells, skeletal cells, skin cells, etc. And then there are the other types of cells called gametic cells or the sex cells, and these are going to form via meiosis. Um, the gametes or the reproductive cells are going to be the sperm and the female egg. Uh, the female egg is also known more scientifically as the female ovum, O-V-U-M. And basically, these cells are going to be haploid. Um, haploid is abbreviated with just the letter N, unlike diploid, which is double that, 2N. And that the reason why it's just the letter N is because haploid cells, the sperm and the egg, have half the chromosome number. So for humans, the sperm carry 23 chromosomes, and the female ovum will also carry 23 chromosomes. So cells and chromosomes, eukaryotes have DNA that is packed in the chromosomes. And there are two types of chromosomes when you look at those uh, karyotypes. There are uh, the autosomal chromosomes, or autosomes. And these are going to be the chromosome pairs that do not determine sex. So on in humans, autosomal chromosomes are going to be pairs 1 through 22. And then there are the sex chromosomes, which are the X and the Y. And the X and the Y chromosome is pair 23. The female ovum always carries the X chromosome, which is the sex chromosome. So for humans, it would be 22 autosomal chromosomes plus that X chromosome. For the sperm, it's going to be those 22 autosomal chromosomes. And then a sperm cell, or a spermatozoa, could either carry an X chromosome or it will carry the Y chromosome. And then ultimately, because of this, it is the male um, who will, the male sperm that will determine the gender of the child. So the female always carries that X chromosome. If a male sperm with the X chromosome fertilizes the egg, then the, uh, the, the newborn child would be a female. If the sperm fertilizes the egg, has that Y chromosome, then the resulting zygote would be XY, and that would develop into a male. So note, all sexually reproducing organisms have both diploid and haploid numbers. And we can see this when we look at the life cycles of, of organisms. Um, for example, here is the life cycle of a human being. And when we look at life cycles, we're basically looking at a sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism from conception to its own reproductive period. And, and when we look at this reproductive period, we can see here in the diagram that the newborn is, under, is a diploid organism, and it's going to grow and develop via the process of mitosis into two adults. Now these two adults have, uh, are, able, are of age or of that time of their life where they're able to produce the sex cells or the gametes, sperm and egg, and those are going to be developed in the, in the gonads for the male, that would be the testes, 
For the female, it would be the ovaries. And meiosis is going to take place to form the female ovum, which is haploid, and the male sperm, which is haploid. And ultimately, when the sperm and the egg meet, that is fertilization, and the resulting uh, cell will be called the zygote. So you go from two haploid cells, and then once fertilized, you restore that diploid number. And then from that point on, the zygote is going to undergo this type of cell division that we learned in Unit 4, known as mitosis, for that organism to grow and develop. So fertilization is when a sperm cell, which is haploid, fuses with an ovum or egg, which is haploid, to form a zygote that is indeed diploid. So let's take a look at this process. Um, meiosis is very similar to mitosis. However, they are two distinct uh, cell, uh, types of cell division. So meiosis is a process that creates haploid gamete cells and sexually reproducing diploid organisms. It's going to result in cells with half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. So for humans, the diploid number 2n equals 46. In meiosis, it's going to produce sperm and egg cells that are haploid, where n is going to equal to 23, which is half of that diploid number. It involves two successive divisions, unlike in mitosis, which is one division. And that's ultimately because we want to go from that diploid number, chromosome number, down to a haploid number. And when we talk about those two uh, successive divisions, we're simply going to call it meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. And we don't see that in mitosis. So let's quick revisit mitosis. So while meiosis is similar to mitosis, there are some key differences. For example, mitosis occurs in somatic cells. Again, somatic cells are the cells of the body that are not the sperm and egg. So it would be all those cells like the muscle, nerve, skin, cardiac cells, um, etc. They undergo one division. So in the M phase, they undergo mitosis and cytokinesis and done. And it's going to result in two diploid daughter cells at the end. And those daughter cells are going to be genetically identical to one another. However, in meiosis, we're going to form gametes. That's why we also say that meiosis is gametogenesis. Um, gametogenesis happening in males, we call spermatogenesis. In females, we call it oogenesis. So we get the formation of gametes, the sperm and egg, in the gonads, the testes, or the ovaries, depending on, on your gender. And ultimately, it's going to go under two divisions, meiosis 1 and then through meiosis 2. And by the end of meiosis 2, we're going to have four haploid daughter cells. And because of the uniqueness of certain events that occur during meiosis, events like crossing over and independent assortment, those end daughter cells that result are going to be genetically unique from one another. So let's take a look at some of these key events that take place. Some of the key events in meiosis happen in three key points. And the first one is prophase one. And in prophase one, what's going to happen is you're going to have homologous chromosome pairs that are going to pair up at their synapsis and allow for an event called crossing over to take place. And crossing over is going to allow for additional genetic recombination, where you get this mix and match of DNA on the homologous chromosome pairs, the chromatids that are closest to one another. And then in metaphase one, tetrads, or a tetrad is when you have those homologous chromosome pairs paired up in a line forming a tetrad, which would be four sister chromatids in, in, in line together. Uh, and they're going to line up along that metaphase plate. And then in anaphase one, those homologous chromosome pairs are going to separate. So let's look at the stages of meiosis. Meiosis one, um, of course, we have interphase. So the cell, like in, in mitosis, goes through G1, S, and G2. Um, G1 is that growth gap one, which is for growth. Um, the cell will slowly start to get ready for division. In the S phase, the DNA is replicated or copied. And then in G2, that cell is definitely prepping itself for division while it continues to carry out its normal cell functions and continues to grow in size. So as the cell gets ready in G2, now we're going to enter into meiosis one. 
And the first thing there is prophase one. And prophase one has this key event where homologous chromosome pairs are going to pair up along their synapsis. And ultimately, they can physically connect to each other, forming this tetrad. So if you look right here, here you see that tetrad formation. So these are homologous chromosome pairs. Uh, you get the paternal, which are the father chromosomes, and the mother chromosomes. And on the chromatids, the homologous chromosome pair, uh, the chromosomes that are closest to each other, which would be these inner chromatids, could wrap around during tetrad formation. And ultimately, crossing over could take place. So a tetrad is when you have four chromatids indicated by one, two, three, and then the outer one here, four, that are all lined up along a synapsis. And when crossing over takes place, or you have this genetic recombination, um, it's going to happen at this point called the chiasmata. And the DNA is going to be exchanged between those homologous chromosome pairs that have paired up along their synapsis. Every chromatid that is produced is now going to have a unique combination of DNA. So there you could see it right there in the diagram. Now, ultimately, so you can see that crossing over took place here. Um, so you can see how there's differences in DNA. So ultimately then, in metaphase one, here's where we have that independent orientation where the tetrads are going to line up along that metaphase plate. So this is going to allow for independent assortment to take place, which means that these chromosomes are going to, as it says, assort or move away from each other independently of where other ones go. And we'll look at that a little bit more as it applies to one of Mendel's principles, the, the principle of independent assortment. In anaphase one, the pairs of homologous chromosomes separate, and basically all the other dynamics of what's going on during these stages with spindle formation, the nuclear envelope disappearing, etc., um, a lot of that being during prophase, that's all taking place too. In anaphase 1, the sister chromatids, remember, are still attached. It's just the homologous chromosomes that, that disappear. In telophase 1, or telophase 1 and cytokinesis, the nuclei and cytoplasm divides. Um, there, are now, there is now a haploid set of chromosomes in each daughter cell. So now we enter into meiosis 2. And in prophase 2, there is no crossing over that takes place. That only happens during prophase 1. Spindle fibers form. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate. Because of crossing over in meiosis 1, the chromatids are now unique from one another. In meiosis 2, anaphase 2, the sister chromatids now separate and move towards opposite poles of the cell. And then in telophase 2 and cytokinesis, ultimately what happens there is we get four haploid daughter cells. So for humans, each of these cells would have 23 chromosomes. The nuclear, nuclei are going to reappear, the mitotic spindle will disappear, the nucleolus will come back, and each daughter cell is going to be genetically different or unique from the other. Now, if we look, um, ultimately then, as a meiosis review, uh, if we see this here, all four of these cells, if this were taking place in the testes, and we had spermatogenesis occurring, all four of those cells would become spermatozoa. However, in the female ovaries, um, only one of these cells would become the mature ovum. The other three, due to unequal division of the cytoplasm, are these smaller cell types that we call polar bodies. And those polar bodies will disintegrate, and then the, the ovum will be released. So how does meiosis lead to genetic variation? First, there's this event that occurs during prophase 1 called crossing over, and it's going to produce recombinant chromosomes that, that um, happens when they exchange that genetic material. The second point is independent assortment of chromosomes, and that's when the chromosomes are randomly oriented along the metaphase plate during metaphase 1, and then each can orient with the maternal or paternal chromosomes closer to a given pole. And then lastly, you have random fertilization, which basically means that you could have any sperm uh, ultimately fertilize the ovum. In closing, putting it all together, 
Meiosis followed by fertilization ensures genetic diversity in sexually reproducing organisms and provides genetic variation that plays a role in natural selection. And this is important because ultimately the, the whole purpose for sex is to ensure the survival of the species. There are very few species out there that do sex for pleasure. Um, humans, dolphins, some great apes are, are examples of those types of organisms that do it for pleasure. But ultimately, the, the, the whole purpose behind reproduction is to ensure the survival of a species over generations to generations to generations. And as you pass on those genes with the traits that you want to be passed on, ultimately you're looking for those characteristics or traits that are going to help your population be the most fit throughout time. Because as we know, time throughout time, things change and you need to be uh, able to adapt to your environment. Otherwise, you would go extinct. This cellular process is driven by the interaction of subcellular components and uses free energy. Remember, that's energy available in the cell to do work that is required for the growth and the reproduction of living systems. Thank you again for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and you could work on the topic one and two questions. Have a nice day.